And then reactions of reductions. So we can take so if we take those classes together, we we can make a chart. But before we make the chart, let's take a step back and see what all those reactions have in common. Okay. So you know what do they what do they all have in common? So I'm going to take my, and I'll just use it as an example here, I'll take my CH3Br and I'm going to add magnesium to it. And this is the only way that I can make a C-. minus. I can't make a C- minus by deprotonating a hydrogen from a carbon because C- minus is the strongest base I've got on the periodic table. It goes C minus stronger than N minus stronger than O minus. Now the carbon carbon triple bond the other day, that CH bond was sort of an anomaly. That one could be deprotonated by NH2 minus, but a regular alkane, you can't deprotonate it to make the C minus because you'd need something stronger. And there is nothing stronger. So you have to do this reaction with the halide plus the magnesium or plus the lithium. And you might say, what's the difference? In this class, there isn't going to be a difference because the cation isn't going to play a role. That's not completely true. But for this class, it's perfectly fine. So if you think about what happens in this reaction, I've got a CH3 with a Br, and I'm going to add to that a magnesium. And magnesium being in row two on the, or being in column two, in group two on the periodic table has, bless you, two unpaired, two unpaired electrons. And so what's going to happen is this. This is kind of a free radical mechanism. So that if I split this carbon bromine bond, I'm going to give one electron to the carbon and one electron to the bromine. And then what the magnesium is going to do is the magnesium is going to transfer, because it's a metal, it's going to transfer one of its electrons also to the carbon. So from the carbon standpoint, the carbon now has two electrons and it has a negative charge. Then the magnesium, the bromine has one unpaired electron, and the magnesium now has one unpaired electron, and so the magnesium can take its unpaired electron and the bromine, and now it can, com it can combine that way. This is purely ionic now, but the magnesium has a two plus charge, the bromide has a minus one, so the net result is that the MGBR has a positive one charge to be the counter ion for the CH3 minus. So what we end up doing is forming the Grignard, which we write as CH3 minus MGBR combined a plus charge. And the stoichiometry of that is one magnesium plus one alkyl halide. The stoichiometry is not the same for the lithium, but it, and I'm not going to, and I'll, I'll ignore the stoichiometry here, but what I'm going to form with the lithium is I'm going to have a simpler molecule that has a CH3- minus with an Li+. Plus. So both of these have the active species, which is the CH3-, minus, and then they have a plus as their counter ion. And so that plus charge isn't going to necessarily play a role, again, as far as we know, or as far as we're interested. These, the structures of these things in solution are far more complicated than this. And that's part of what I did my postdoc and my graduate work and research. We, I, 
occasionally do that here as well. So we won't go down that road of, of that. We're just going to say what well, our focus really is. Our focus is really on the R minus, the carbanion. Okay. So the carbanion then, if I can make I can make any carbanion I want by simply have starting with the alkyl halide. And so if I wanted to, for instance, make a carbanion with Let's say I wanted this whole part right here to be a carbanion. I would just need to have a bromine attached to it. And then when I treated that with my magnesium or I treated it with my lithium, I would then end up with that carbon having the negative charge and having then the magnesium metal with the bromine as the counter ion. So now I could go ahead and take that entire large negative charge and add it to a carbonyl. So that's, that's the first thing that all these reactions have in common. I'm making a negatively charged species and to make the carbon, I just need to have a halogen on there, usually bromide, and reacting it with lithium or magnesium to make the C minus. So that's all we need to do to make the C minus. Okay. So that's that's our general principle. We don't have to memorize 15 reactions. We just have to remember R with the halogen is going to become, become an R minus with the magnesium bromide. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? So then what am I going to do? Then I'm going to take that R minus. Yeah. So then I'm going to take the R minus and I'm going to add it to a carbonyl. What kind of carbonyl? Well, we can make a table of every single carbonyl and what kind of alcohol it gives. We could do that. But let's just take a step back and see what's common about all these reactions. And there's two classes of reactions. Okay, so if we take this R minus, we're going to add it to a carbonyl. What kind of carbonyl? Well, let's start with either a ketone or an aldehyde. Okay. Now, what's common about those two is that they have an R group on one side of the carbonyl. If it's an R group, it's a ketone. If it's an H group, it's an aldehyde. So when we react a Grignard with a ketone or an aldehyde, what's going to happen? Well, what happened the other day with the C triple bond C minus? The carbonyl carbon's delta plus, the oxygen's delta minus. You're going to have the negative charge come in. It's going to attack the electrophilic part of the carbonyl. And then the pair of electrons is going to move up to the O so that I'm going to make and let's make this R1 and make this R2 so then I'm going to have my R2 and then my R or my H on the other side I just added R1 to the carbon and I just made an O minus so I just formed this carbon R1 bond
Now, what we're going to learn, what we're going to see throughout the rest of the year is that whenever we add a nucleophile to a carbonyl and we form the O minus, this O minus species is going to want to try and form the carbon oxygen bond. It's going to want to try and reform it because a carbonyl bond is very stable. So it'll try and bring its pair of electrons back down. But if it does that, then something's got to leave. And our two strongest bases, our two strongest bases are R minus and H minus. Those are the strongest bases we can have. which means that those are the two worst leaving groups because because leaving groups leaving group ability is based on one thing basicity inversely so a really strong base is going to make a really really poor leaving group so po so poor that these will never leave. They'll never be leaving groups. You're never going to do a reaction where a nucleophile is going to come in and kick off a hydrogen or kick off an alkyl group. So that means that when we use ketones and aldehydes that the O- tries to reform the carbonyl by moving this down here, but it can't because there's no leaving groups attached to the carbon. And so if there's no leaving groups attached to the carbon, it's stuck. And once it gets stuck, it just kind of hangs out as an O minus and it waits for us to add H plus. And when we add the H plus, then the O minus gets protonated so that we can form an OH. And so what I did was I added my alkyl group, I formed the carbon-carbon bond, and I made an alcohol out of it. And the carbon attached to the OH is the carbon that the alkyl group added to. So there's three reactions here that that's the mechanism for. There's actually four if you go back and count the C triple bond C minus. And then there's like another set three if you take and modify this a little bit. So if you want a chart, here's how you would create the chart. Let's just say I've got CH3 minus, but remember, CH3 minus could be anything minus. Let's, let's do all the possibilities of the of aldehydes and ketones. So if I had a Grignard to the first one, this is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is the one carbon aldehyde. We usually keep dead things in formaldehyde. Although, in our biology department, all the dead stuff is in methanol because they got rid of formaldehyde years ago. And then we have a regular aldehyde and we have a ketone. So, this re it's going to do this reaction with all three of these molecules. So what am I going to get then in terms of alcohols on the other side? I'm going to get a, as the final product, I'm going to add a CH3. Well, 
bless you. And so we can write And so I can write the three alcohols that I would get from the CH3 minus, adding to each one of these, and then having the pair of electrons move up to the oxygen. And so what kind of alcohol did I make from formaldehyde? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? I made a primary alcohol using formaldehyde. Using an aldehyde then, I made what kind of alcohol in the second reaction? Secondary. And then I made what kind of alcohol in the last reaction? Tertiary. So a lot of times I'll see in the textbooks they'll say, if you know, if you want to make a primary alcohol, use formaldehyde. If you want to make a secondary alcohol, use an aldehyde. If you want to make a tertiary alcohol, use a ketone. Okay, but to be honest, I don't have to really memorize those three reactions. I just have to figure out how to make the product that I'm looking for, which we'll come back to in a minute. But all three of those mechanisms were exactly the same. All three of them were exactly the same. Okay. So, so do you see the commonality here? And there'd be a commonality from the other day because if I had my C triple bond C minus, what would it do? The same thing. So it really just depends on my R minus that I'm making, my carbanion. My carbanion is going to add the formaldehyde, an aldehyde, or a ketone exactly the same way. And again, if I asked you this mechanism, it would be two steps. The C minus attacking the carbonyl, and then taking the O minus and adding H plus to it. the easiest mechanism I can give you. Now against my better judgment here, I'm going to make a little change to this reaction. And I'm going to, and I'm going to move away and you're going to be like, oh, wait, you're getting out of Grignard's. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to take a diversion into another reaction that's not a Grignard reaction but it's this exact same mechanism. And that is, I want to reduce the carbon-oxygen double bond. Because that was part of, the, part of the readings for today as well. How do you do reductions? So first, first question is, what is reduction? Gain of... Yes, inorganic gain of hydrogens or loss of oxygen. In this case, it's going to be gain of hydrogens. So I want to do a reduction. If I want to do a reduction, what should I be adding to the carbonyl? Not an R group, but and an H. So I need an H that's a nucleophile. So I need an H minus. R minus, I'm going to change to H minus. What's the H minus going to do? It's going to come in and attack the carbonyl. I'm going to form my carbon hydrogen bond and my O minus. My O minus is going to try and reform the carbonyl, but 
if there's only hydrogens and R groups attached to the carbonyl, no leaving groups. So I'm stuck. And then I'm going to take my final step and add H plus to it. So that, what did I just do? My net result is I added two hydrogens across the carbon oxygen double bond. Not like hydrogen and palladium. Oh, you can do that. But with an H minus to form the O minus and then add H plus. So if I do that on these three molecules, what have I done? I've now reduced an aldehyde and a ketone and it's exactly the same mechanism, exactly the same philosophy, exactly the same strategy. My only problem is where did the H- minus come from? We have done NAB, we've used NABH4 before, sodium borohydride. So the BH4 has four H minuses. And now there's another reagent that I can use called lithium aluminum hydride, which is much more powerful. But for aldehydes and ketones, you would just use sodium borohydride. We don't need to go with the higher with the higher level reducer. Okay. So what's my point here? That's a good question. I should, what, should probably have thought of that before I asked that. What is my point? My point is, I, I knew what my point was ahead of time. Um, that when we're reacting formaldehyde or an aldehyde or a ketone with CH3 minus, that's how we make the primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. But I can do those same three reactions with an H minus, and they're exactly the same. Okay. There's nothing new except the source of the H minus. So, in terms of Grignard's and reductions, the first class of reactions involves aldehydes, or formaldehyde, aldehyde, and a ketone. If I, if I change the carbonyl functional group, I'm going to get a second class of reactions that have a slightly different mechanism. Okay. So if we wanted to make a chart, you could make a chart here of primary, secondary, tertiary, and do the same thing with H minus, and you would end up with methanol, you would end up with a primary alcohol, and you would end up with a secondary alcohol. You can't make a tertiary alcohol from reduction, because reduction means one of the groups is going to be hydrogen, and that's not compatible with the tertiary. So if we group these reactions together, then I just have to remember I'm adding R minus or H minus to the carbonyl. And it's straightforward. Add, add H plus, done. No extra step. We all okay with that? So let's make it a little more difficult here. Let's take our Grignard and let's add to it now a, well, let's do this. Let's add a carboxylic acid to it, the trick question. I mean, there really aren't trick questions, but this 
could be considered a trick question. And I can almost guarantee that if I ask this question on Monday, I will get at least one incorrect answer, statistically. What? Probably. But this is what you would call a trick question. I don't call it a trick question, but you would. So what's going what's gonna to happen in this reaction? I've got a Grignard, which is a strong nucleophile and a strong base, reacting with what kind of functional group? A carboxylic acid. So what kind of reaction is going to happen? Acid-base reaction. So when you see this, you go, I'm just going to add my CH3- to the carbonyl. No. The CH3- minus is going to deprotonate the carboxylic acid, and so you're going to form a deprotonated carboxylic acid called the carboxylate, and you're going to form your CH bond. And this brought up the topic of, because Grignards are such strong bases, there's things you need to keep them away from if you're going to do a Grignard reaction. Like in the lab, if I'm going to do a Grignard reaction, I cannot have any water that comes in contact with the Grignard. I cannot have any alcohol come in contact with the Grignard. I can't, I can't have any NH bond, any amine come in contact with the Grignard because in all of these cases the Grignard is going to deprotonate those and you're going to kill your Grignard so that it can't react anymore. So that means in the lab I have to dry my glassware really well I can't do the reaction out in the open atmosphere because there's moisture in the atmosphere. So I've got to do it under an inert gas like nitrogen, purified nitrogen gas or maybe argon gas that doesn't have any moisture in it. So I've got to keep these compounds, these acidic compounds, away from my Grignard. But, the, but this will be a side reaction. This will produce the alkane, and so I've just killed it. So you can't do a reaction with a carboxylic acid, which is a type of carbonyl. Okay. So I can do the reaction with aldehydes and ketones. Can't do it with a carboxylic acid. So what other kinds of carb... What, kinds, what other kinds of um, carbonyl functional groups do I have? Well, we skipped that in Chapter 2, the naming of all the different functional groups. So an another one that we would do is this. This is a carboxylic acid chloride. We'll talk about it in the future in terms of what kinds of reactions it can do. And the other, the other carbonyl that we can react with this is an ester. An ester has a C double bond O with an OR group on the other side. So these two compounds we can actually, these two carbonyls, we can react with Grignards. Their mechanisms are going to be a little bit different than what the first one was. Just a little bit different. So let's so let's look at what happens there. So if I take my CH3 minus and I add it to the carboxylic acid chloride, what's the first step in the mechanism going to be? Have the CH3 minus attack the carbonyl and have that pair of electrons move up to the oxygen.
Same first step. But remember what we said before. Now the O minus wants to bring its pair of electrons back down and reform the carbonyl. Can that happen this time? Is there a group that can leave? The chloride. The chloride. So the chloride could leave. And then what do I end up forming? Then I end up forming the ketone. With now the with now the CH3 group added to the carbonyl. So if you can imagine that we added, if we add just one equivalent of Grignard to one equivalent of acid chloride, if all of the CH3 minus hasn't reacted with the acid chloride at this point, what could it do with this ketone? More CH3 could then add to that ketone because it's a ketone like we just learned. And so now if that if another equivalent of CH3 minus adds, I'm going to end up now adding two CH3 minuses to my what was carbonyl group and end up with the O minus. And now the O minus wants to reform the carbonyl but it can't because there's nothing to leave now. So now it's stuck, it waits around to be protonated, and so now what I made was, now I made an alcohol, a tertiary alcohol, where two of the groups now came from the Grignard. And if I did this in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, I would end up at the end having some of the tertiary alcohol some of the ketone and maybe even some unreacted acid chloride. Because the molecules all don't react at the same time. So what I do is I come over here and say, you know what, let's use two Grignards and let's just force it all the way to the tertiary alcohol. So two, so two Grignards plus an acid chloride makes the tertiary alcohol, but now two of the groups came from the Grignard. And this whole, and the reason why I'm, and the reason why I'm kind of showing this early is, and sometimes this works out, sometimes it doesn't. But when we get to carbonyl chemistry, there's a whole chapter on just, acid, just aldehydes and ketones. Because the aldehyde with the H or the ketone with the alkyl groups are not leaving groups, so they have one set of reactions. And then when we get to acid chlorides and esters and other carbonyl groups, they're in another chapter because they now have a group that can leave. And so they have a completely different set of reactions. And it's not completely different, it's just that now my O minus, when it forms, can come back down and kick off a leaving group. If I did this same reaction with an ester, I would end up with the same kind of product. I'm going to end up with a tertiary alcohol with two of the groups coming from the gradient. So esters 
and carboxylic acids. Are the same, undergo the same kind of reaction. And I'll point out one other thing that notice in the final product, the chlorine and the OR group are gone. So that's why those two get classified together. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to change my R minus group to an H minus. What's the final product going to look like? going to not only look like a primary, it's going to be a primary. So I'm going to end up adding two H's. So I'm going to end up up here with the OH, and I'm going to end up adding the two H's to that carbon. So I'm going to end up with a primary alcohol. And the mechanism would be exactly the same. Go back to the mechanism I just wrote, erase all the R's, erase all the CH3 minuses, and put in an H minus. Now, the sodium borohydride, the borohydride has as many as four H minuses. So that's where the two H minuses comes from, is from the borohydride. Uh, we only need two H minuses, actually. Oh, this this hydrogen came from the O minus reacting with the H plus, right? Because in all these mechanisms, what we've done is we've ended up with an O minus, and then we add H plus. So in all of these mechanisms, the way they'll be written out is you'll see two H minuses plus an acid chloride, and then over the arrow you'll see and then H plus, meaning that after the first reactions occurred, in the second reaction we're gonna add H plus. If we did this in the lab, what we would end up forming is when we form the O minus, which again is an alkoxide from what we did before, that's an ionic species and it's going to precipitate out of the solution. So we would end up with all this white solid. And then we'd have to add H plus in order to protonate it and actually turn it back into its alcohol form. So what's my point here? My point here is that we now have a second class of reactions because if this group, if one of the groups that's attached to the carbonyl can leave, I'm now going to add two C minuses or two H minuses, and I'm not only, and then I'm going to add both of those to the carbonyl because that group's going to leave. And so if you did this reaction, if I said, let's take two. H minuses and add it to an ester. You would end up splitting the ester apart. 
so that I, your R, your OR group could leave. And the carbonyl carbon would end up with two H's added to it and would end up with, as a primary alcohol. And this is where some books say you can't use sodium borohydride with an ester, although that's not true, you can. <coughs> Bless you. This is where you have to use the stronger lithium aluminum hydride. But either one of those will work. So this is a second class of reactions, basically. So can we make a chart of all this? We could. But it's all, in essence, the same mechanism. If it's, if there's no, if the two things attached to the carbonyl are not leaving groups, then it's just going to be addition, protonate the O minus, you're done. If one of those two groups can leave, like a chloride or the OR group, then you're going to add one R minus or H minus, kick off the leaving group, and add a second one. So we, so we can sort of bundle these reactions together in both R minus and H minus. And then we don't necessarily have to remember a 10, 10 reaction table. We're basically down to two. The OR will protonate itself. So in other words, when you add, you're going to add H plus H2O to this anyway, to take this O minus and protonate it. At the same time, you're going to protonate that, that RO minus. So it, it gets protonated at the same time. The thing I'm showing you is when you reduce or when you do a Grignard with, a, with this, you end up with this OR this ROH group on the other side. Okay. And there are, I believe, two other Grignards that are just by themselves. But we could figure them out. So let's say I take my CH3- and I add carbon dioxide to it. And if you're looking at that one, you're like, I don't remember this one. Okay? We know the CH3- minus has to react with an electrophilic atom. What's the electrophilic atom over here on the carbon dioxide? The carbon. So the carbon is delta plus, and each one of these oxygens is delta minus. All right, so the CH3- minus is going to have its pair of electrons add to that carbon. What do I have to do now? What have I been doing? I've been breaking the CO bond and giving it to the oxygen. So let's do the same thing here, except what do I have? i got two choices. Does it matter which one I break? No, because it's symmetrical. So let's do that. So what did I just do? So I added my CH3 to my carbon, which now changes into an O minus, and the other one stays as a C double bond out. And so what did I just make? A deprotonated Okay, if you don't like that, we have to put our then H plus H2O step. If I put in my then 
H plus H2O step, I'm gonna take my O minus and I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna protonate it and that, that's what kind of functional group? That's a carboxylic acid. So I just made a carboxylic acid. So this is its own reaction. But is it the same mechanism? Pretty much. And then was there reduction of carboxylic acids? I think there I think there was. I'll just throw it in. Yeah, it has to be. This one has to be lithium aluminum hydride. So lithium aluminum hydride plus a carboxylic acid is going to reduce the carboxylic acid all the way down to its lowest state, which is going to be a primary alcohol. And the only issue with the lithium aluminum hydride is it is a far more powerful reducing reagent than sodium borohydride. And so you just have to be careful with it. I think that's the story I usually tell with the lithium aluminum hydride is that this is over 20 years ago when we had a master's we had a master's program here I had like five master's students four of which completed and so my first master's student who worked in industry and came in on like weekends to do his experimental work we were reducing carbonyls down with lithium aluminum hydride and I came back in those days my lab was right behind my office so I came back to the office, walked through the office to the lab, and he's like, oh, the lithium aluminum hydride bottle caught on fire. And he just said that matter-of-factly, so he wasn't freaked out by it. And I said, okay, how did you put the fire out? And he goes, well, I just grabbed sand and threw it on top of it. I'm like, okay, that's what you do. Because if you try and add water to it, the lithium aluminum hydride produces hydrogen gas, and all that does is just create a bigger fire. So you have to smother it with sand. So lithium aluminum hydride will occasionally spontaneously burst into flames. So you have to be careful with it. Um, if you really wanted to make sure, what you would do is put it in a glove bag, what's called a glove bag, or a dry box. Oh. Think of like a think of like a baby box with the you know with the with the gloves you reach in and. You know, but you keep them isolated. There is, you do that and you fill it with like nit purified nitrogen gas or argon gas, and then you just would kind of weigh out the solid in there where there's no oxygen. But if you're, if you do it quickly, it won't catch on fire. But it did. And some of these, some of these lithium, some of these C minus lithium compounds are tad bit pyrophoric as well because they react with moisture and oxygen from the air so there we were growing little tiny crystals of those to determine their structure and trying to put the crystals on the x-ray diffractometer fiber and there was nitrogen gas blowing through that so you didn't expose it to air but then one of the crystals fell off and i was trying to get the other one on and then I kind of like, oh, something's burning. And it fell onto a napkin and caught the napkin on fire. It didn't really catch it on fire. It, smold it was like smoldering. And... But some of the lithium compounds, like tersbutyl lithium, which would be a tersbutyl group with a C- minus with an Li+, plus, the minute that compound hits the air, it becomes a flame. So you're adding a sample from a syringe, 
and all of a sudden it's a flamethrower. And the first time I used that, I wasn't, I was pretty cavalier about it until, you know, a six inch flame shot out the thing. As I'm going to add it to hexanes, which you don't want to blow a flame into hexanes because it's a tad bit flammable. And that scared them out of me. So I was a little more, less cavalier using it. But all of those reagents are technically what you would call pyrophoric. So you, and, and the reason is because they're all strong bases that will react with the, with the moisture. And then H minus, once it gets protonated, it forms hydrogen gas, which with the oxygen is a perfect fuel. So it's like sodium metal. You have sodium metal and it reacts with water, produces hydrogen gas, that's what causes the big flame or explosion. So you have to be careful with all these reagents. But lithium aluminum hydride is much more powerful. And so it'll reduce a carb it'll reduce the carboxylic acid down to the primary alcohol. Okay. So there's all the reactions. And that's what's in com that's what they have in common. Does that make sense? I mean we need some problems, obviously. What about the other the other topics? Because that was just the first group for today. What was the other group? Oh, epoxide ring opening. So if we're going to do epoxide ring opening, we need to make an epoxide. So how do we convert a double bond into an epoxide? What reagent would I use? Yell it out when you got it. What reagent do I use to do that reaction? I want to make an epoxide out of a double bond. What? No. That's how I'm going to open up the epoxide. So that's the next step. That's the next step. Because there's two ways to do it. Acid catalyzed ring opening and base in base or strong nucleophile catalyzed ring opening. But first I need to know how to make the epoxide. So what? Nope. That makes a triangular intermediate with, but with a mercury in it. There's two ways. Mm, that makes a triangle too, Megan. Ozone? Mm, no, not quite. A peroxy acid. We talked about a peroxy acid when we talked about a bromohydrin, I believe. So there's two ways to do this. One is to use a peroxy acid. What is a peroxy acid? It's a carboxylic acid with an extra oxygen in there. 
In chemistry, that's what per means. Right? Hydrogen peroxide means there's an extra oxygen in there or else it would be water. This is the peroxy acid. And so it's going to make the epoxide in one shot. The other method would be to add Br2 and H2O first. Uh oh, this is a good chance for good time for review. What would the product of this reaction be? Well, I know, I know if I'm going to write the product, the first thing I do is erase the double bond and write the molecule. Now I just got to figure out what to add to it. And here's my A and B carbon. So here's my A and then my B carbon. So Br2 and H2O, what am I adding? You can go right back to basics. Right, this was what, Tuesday we did this? We made the big chart? A Br and an OH, how? Trans and Markovnikov. So where should the Br go? A or B? Where does the Br go? A or B? Do we have a consensus? What's our consensus? Do we all agree B? Yes, I agree B. That's a valid question, why? Could be. I mean, it, it's going to go through the triangular intermediate, which is why we're going to add the BR and the OH trans. But as far as adding Markovnikov, what's the BR plus the equivalent of? And the H plus. And so if this is Markovnikov addition, the H plus or the BR plus or any plus is going to go to the carbon with the most hydrogens, which is carbon B. So the Br is going to add here, and the OH is going to add here. So they're going to add 100% trans. Actually, I don't, I don't like that. So I'm going to write it. I'm going to write it trans it a little bit better. I'm going to write the OH here and the Br there. Okay. So I'm adding a Br, OH, Markovnikov, 100% trans. Now, since this is an acyclic system. It's hard to show the trans because I have free rotation. Once I do that, I'm going to go ahead and add sodium hydroxide, the key thing being the hydroxide. The hydroxide is going to come in and deprotonate the OH, and it's going to form an O minus. The O minus is then going to attack the bromine and kick it off to form the epoxide. So this is going to do what's called an intramolecular SN2. Because the OH and the BR added trans, the OH is in a perfect position to do a backside attack once it becomes an O minus. So 
you can do either one of these in order to make the epoxide. The simplest one is to add the peroxy acid in one step. But the other method which I could very well ask is add the Br2OH to make the bromohydrin and then you deprotonate it to form the epoxy. I feel like I feel like I have a review question. Oh, I do. A little bit off topic, but nev review never hurts. Well, it hurts, but it needs to be done. So for this first, so for this reaction of the Br two H two O two, is it regioselective, stereoselective, both, or neither? So for that reaction, is it regio, stereo, both, or neither? You have three minutes. Then I want a consensus answer. Unless there is no consensus and We could, we could use those. And if we use those, then A is going to be regio only, B is going to be stereo only, C is going to be both, and D is going to be neither. So we will use the, the clicker card. Now, for those of you who, for those of you who just got the card, you can see there's a. Have you ever used those before? So on the side of the on the side of the symbol, there's an A, B, C, or D. You hold it so that the letter that's on top is your answer, and then I scan it with my phone that now has 13% on it. So we won't be. Yeah, this might be the last question of the day. I'll have to just ask random people. And then you, the other thing you have to do is make sure your hand isn't in the figure. There you go. All right, let's see what we've got. We've got four Regios only and seven bolts. Well, that would take all the fun out of it if I immediately agree or disagree. So what's the difference in those answers? I guess the, I guess the question is whether it's stereo. If you're saying both, then we're all agreed it's regioselective. 
right? So if I had the bromine and OH this way and I add it this way, I get two different products. So we're all in agreement it's regioselective. What we're not in agreement is whether it's stereoselective or not. So what are our, so again, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but how are we gonna determine stereoselectivity? Two, two things, what's number one? Okay, that's, okay, so did, we need two chiral centers. Do we have two chiral centers? No. Um, but before the chiral centers, we could say, is it 100% cis or trans? So is it 100% cis or trans? Yes. Did I make a product with two chiral centers? No. Because this CH2 isn't a chiral center. So with that not having a chiral center, then it is not stereoselective. And so regioselective is the correct answer. And I think before we kind of, you know, we may have made a little bit of a flow chart to talk about, okay, you know, how do you do that? But there's two questions for stereoselectivity. Is it 100% cis or 100% trans? And does it make a product with two chiral centers? Yes. Because any other chiral center is irrelevant. So it's got to be on the chiral, it has to be those chirals, those, ca those carbons. And of course, any reaction that does 100% cis or trans could be regioselective, right? Be or well, anything could be regioselective unless it's symmetrical. So. Okay. Oh, uh, what did we do? All we did was make an epoxide. That's all we did. So, okay, great. We can make an epoxide. So now my question is, I want to open up this epoxide. So there's reactions. To open up that epoxide. Well, that's a good question. So what do I mean by opening up the epoxide? There's two ways to open up an epoxide. And by opening it up, I mean I'm going to take the triangle away and just open it up. So the first method is what's called, what did they call it? They call it acid catalyzed. I'm not a big fan of the term acid catalyzed because it's not always acid catalyzed. But let's say you do it under acidic conditions. So acidic epoxide ring opening. I'm going to add H plus to my epoxide. What's going to happen? Epoxide plus acid, first step in the reaction is...
shoot, I didn't even bring my iPad so I could randomly call on people. And my phone's just about dead. The exact phrase, protonate the oxygen. Great. So now I have that. Let's make this specific. Okay, is the oxygen happy with the plus charge? No, so what's it gonna do? It's gonna push the plus charge down to the to the two carbons that are attached to it. giving each of those two carbons a delta positive charge. And in this case, it's going to share with a little bit of that delta positive charge, but not a whole lot. Most of it's going to go down to the, most of it's going to go down to the two carbons. Anybody having a sense of deja vu? I mean, I am, but then again, I've been doing this a long time. No one is having a sense of deja vu. Now, Well, we kind of are doing that by putting delta plus charges on it. Or the other. It's going to go one way or the other. Right? So I'm going to I'm going to have a nucleophile down here that's going to come in whether it's a nucleophile that's neutral or has a negative charge. The nucleophile is going to come in and attack either carbon A or carbon B and the OH is going to go in the opposite direction. Right? So what is this like? Bromonium ion. Bromonium ion. It's like the bromonium ion. basically the same reaction as the bromonium ion. So then you know what my next question is going to be? It's my next question. Where's the nucleophile going to add? Carbon A or carbon B? We did do it last time. Wait, the fake carbocation like thing? In quotes. That's an excellent question. Which one of those two carbons is more delta? A? Because this one looks like a, quote, 
tertiary carbocation, and this one looks like a, quote, primary carbocation. So where's the nucleophile going to add? It's going to add to the carbon with the most delta positive charge, which means it's going to add to A. And then what's going to happen to the OH group? It's going to go over. So remember, this is acidic. So when you add an H plus to the epoxide first, you're going to add the nucleophile to the carbon that is most substituted. And it doesn't matter if you add acid to this, it does not matter whether that nucleophile is neutral or negatively charged. If you add acid first, the nucleophile is going to add to the carbon with the most substituents. So the OH is going to end up on the carbon with the least number of alkyl groups, and the nucleophile is going to add up on the carbon with the most alkyl groups, and they are going to end up 100% trans because it's the triangle. So this is one of these things where acidic ring opening Oh wait, we did this with the bromonium ion. And if I would have said that, everybody would have been, what's the bromonium ion? Right, so we've, we did this before. But the critical part here is I need to put a positive charge in that epoxide. And the way I do it is by protonating the O. Because if I don't protonate the O, and, well, let's just go back. What did we say this kind of mechanism was? This look, it has both characteristics of both SN1 and SN2, right? SN2 because it's backside attack that gives you the trans, but SN1 because the nucleophile adds to the carbon with the most positive charge. So it's in terms of the regioselectivity. In other words, which of those two structural isomers am I going to make? It's SN1. So now you might say, as the book does, let's add a strong nucleophile to this epoxide without acid. So take a strong nucleophile and add it to the epoxide without acid. What's going to happen? This nucleophile is strong enough it doesn't need acid to open up the epoxide. So where's that nucleophile now going to add? A or B? B? Anybody agree? That it's going to add to B? You want A? Anybody else want A? <coughs> What'd you say? Anybody else want to throw in? Another B? Oh. 
Why did you choose A? Okay. So, so basically, same reasoning as before. So you, you can make that argument that A still has more delta positive charge because it's tertiary than B, which isn't, which is primary. So you could still make that argument. And that would be an argument for B. So the question is, why is prognation important? It could. So that's the argument. The argument is, A still has a little bit more delta positive charge than B, because it's tertiary. So you could say the nucleophile could add that if SN1 is going to guide this reaction. And if you think it's more SN2 guiding this reaction, then it's going to add to B because B is less sterically hindered. Now, when I added a plus charge to this ring, I forced the positive charge down to those two carbons. So the delta positive difference, those two carbons shared a positive one charge. In this case, there's no charge. So the difference in the difference in delta positive charge here is going to be very small simply because it's not positive one overall the oxygen didn't give up a complete negative charge to that carbon or a positive charge it didn't take all the electron density away so the so the critical part here is when you protonate you force those two carbons to have a very large difference in delta positive charge and if you don't protonate those delta positive charges will be slightly different but not tremendously different and so if they're not tremendously different then the SN2 mechanism is going to be more dominant so that when when you use a strong nucleophile without acid which is the only way you can use a strong nucleophile, by the way. Right? If I have a strong nucleophile and I put acid and I add acid to it, what happens? It becomes a weak nucleophile because now it's the nucleophile with an acid protonated by the acid. So now we're going to change the mechanism to be SN2. So the nucleophile is now going to add in one shot to the least sterically hindered. So now I'm going to make well, here's what I'm going to make. The first thing is I'm going to have an O minus on this side because the O is going to break. I'm still going to add the nucleophile. The nucleophile and the O minus are still going to be 100% trans because I'm still going through a triangle. But now I'm going to make the O minus because I didn't add acid. And so then I'm going to need a second step where I add my acid to protonate my O minus to now form the OH. So without acid, just strong nucleophile opening of the epoxide, that's going to be an SN2 process so that the nucleophile is going to add to the carbon that's least hindered and the OH is going to add on the carbon that's most substituted.
So I would have accepted if you were going to argue B and you just would have said, well, it's going to be opposite. I would have accepted that answer up to a point. Mm -hmm. But this is why it's opposite. Because now I'm not putting a full-blown charge in the ring and I'm not accentuating the difference between tertiary and primary. If you want that to happen, put a full-blown positive charge in the ring by using acid. <coughs> so here's our two ring openings. Acid, the nucleophile is going to end up on the carbon that is most substituted, one with the most substituents. If I open it up with strong nucleophile, the nucleophile is going to end up on the least hindered carbon, and the OH is going to end up on the other carbon. All of them 100% trans. So we'll take our five minute break so I can go get a charger for my phone. And then when you come back, write the products of these reactions.
So there's there are one, two, three, four, five epoxide ring openings. So what I'd like to do is to write down is to write the product of each one of those. I'm not concerned about I'm not necessarily concerned about the stereochemistry because we know that it is going to be that those two groups would add trans and we know none of these reactions are stereoselective because none of them are going to generate two chiral centers. So what I'm more interested in is what are you adding 
and how in the regio selectivity of how you're adding. Okay. Then we'll go through and all. And you can tell me what your products look like. I can at least 
well, this isn't worth partial points. But I can at least, if I write the molecule without the epoxide, that's going to be the skeleton of the structure. And if these are carbons A and B, the question is who's going, what groups am I, what groups am I going to end up with? Well, when I'm opening it up, up an epoxide, the first or one of the groups is always going to be an an OH. So the question is where does the OH go? Well, it's going to depend on whether it's acidic or base or acidic or strong nucleophile, right? Number 1. I'm adding what? I'm adding Cl minus. Acidic or strong nucleophile? Yeah. So the first one is acidic. So where will the nucleophile end up? On carbon A. And what will be on carbon B? The OH. Okay, so after I write my core structure, I need to figure out what the nucleophile is <coughs> and is it acidic <coughs> or is it strong nucleophile? Those are the two questions I need to ask. What nucleophile am I adding? Because the other group is going to become an OH. And then is it acidic or is it under strong nucleophile or non-acidic conditions? So for number one here, it's acidic, it's a Cl minus, the Cl goes to the carbon that's most substituted, the OH goes to the other. Number two, What am I adding to the epoxide? H2O, which is going to become an OH. So H2O means I'm going to add an OH. Acidic? Yes, it's acidic. So that means the OH is going to add to the carbon with the most substituents. Does it matter? No, because I'm adding two OHs. Number three. Acidic or strong nucleophile? Okay, strong nucleophile. NaBH4, what's my nucleophile? No. Sodium borohydride. H minus is my nucleophile. Where's my where's my H minus? So this is not acidic. So where is my H minus going to end up? Carbon B, which is the least sterically hindered. Where is the OH going to be? On the other one. Number four, methyl, CH3 minus. Acidic, strong nucleophile, strong nucleophile, no acid. So strong nucleophile, what's my nucleophile? CH3 minus, so the CH3 minus is going to go on carbon A or carbon B? B. And so what goes on carbon A? OH. <coughs> yeah. 
if you were totally lost. This is you're kind of getting the hang of it. So what's the nucleophile? Is it acidic or strong nucleophile? Acidic means the nucleophile goes to the most substituted group and the strong nucleophile goes to the least substituted or least hindered. I like least hindered better. Number four, Cl minus, then H plus H2O. Acidic or strong nucleophile? Strong nucleophile because it's then H plus H2O. So strong nucleophile, what's my nucleophile? Cl minus, where's it going to go? least sterically hindered. Look at number one and number five. What did I just do? And they did what? They produced the opposite product. Helping. I'll add one more to this. Oops, oh, sorry, that isn't a double bond, that's an epoxide. Okay. What would these two products be? And as is usually the case, I'm gonna put a little I'm gonna put a little twist on this. Mm -hmm. 
what what's causing you problems. Yeah. So you got to put it on the most substituted. But okay, then what happens? That's for the one that's down. What if it's tied? And you're going to get both of them, right? Okay, take your take your chalkboard and take your chalkboard and um, or take your little whiteboard and how about the product the de the product um, at the bottom br minus plus h plus write the major product there. Okay. Okay, okay. No rearrangements. Uh no rear you've got to make sure. So you're either adding you're either adding you're adding a bromine. We're adding a bromine to carbon A or B and then an OH to the other A or B. So we gotta make sure it's A or B. Okay? Okay? You want both? For the bottom one? For this one? Okay. Okay? So I see, so most of the answer has been That one, right? That was the one that I saw the most of. And then I saw both. Then I saw the other product. Or both products. And then I did see some bromines over on this carbon. You gotta be careful where, you, where you're adding. You're only adding to A or B. Okay, so why did you form this product? Okay, it's a strong nucleophile reaction. And so the bromine's gonna the nucleophile is bromine. It's gonna end up on the carbon that is. This is strong nucleophile, not acid. Least hindered. They're tied in least hindrance. Okay, so that means that when you wrote, if they're tied, you should have had both products written down. But are they tied? Are they really tied? So you're saying they're least hindered because each one of these carbons is what kind of carbon? Secondary. But can we go a level further than that? So while they're both secondary, this A has what kind of group attached to it? A large cyclohexane ring, whereas B has just a, a smaller methyl group. So, really, which one is least sterically hindered? B is going to be less sterically hindered. So, I, I give you this problem simply because if they were tied, you would have to write both products down. But, in this case, I, you have to look beyond the um, secondary carbon and say a methyl versus a versus a cyclohexane, the cyclohexane is going to be much larger. 
That's why that's why I specifically use the term least hindered. As opposed to let's say less substituted. Because according to the less substituted, they're tied. So when I say least hindered, I mean not only is it primary, secondary, tertiary, but what are the groups attached to it? How about the one, how about the, ver the uh, horizontal one here, adding HBR? The opposite of that, so the OH here and the BR there. That. I don't know, that's a good question. So what should we, should, let's go back. Acidic, yes. Nucleophile, BR. <laughs> Nucleophile, BR. Where's the BR going to add? To the carbon that is most substituted. So it actually would be both in this case. Because in this, okay, well... All right. What's the difference between substituted is substituted the same as hindrance? And the answer is no. Substituted is strictly based on primary, secondary, tertiary. Because remember that in this case, we're looking at the delta positive charge. In the top case, we're looking at the delta positive charge that's attached, that is with those two carbons. And we have to go back and remember, what's more stable, a tertiary carbocation with three methyls or a tertiary carbocation with three ethyls? Tertiary with three methyls, tertiary with three ethyls. They're the same. Because the group doesn't matter. So for substitution, the group doesn't matter. For hindrance, the group matters. Because hindrance means size. But when we're talking about carbocation or delta positive charges, all groups are the same. So HBR would give a 50-50 mixture of those two products, whereas the vertical reaction with BR minus would give it would give both products, but this by far and away would be the major product because it's adding the BR minus to the less hindered. Does that make sense? Okay, so Monday. You could create a list of topics from your notes or from the reading assignments for Monday's exam. You want a list of topics? There it is. For Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and today. There's your list of topics. It's what's, on, it's what's in each folder. <laughs> Can I still email you that? Right. Well, what are you going to have to do then? 
you're going to have to write the products of the reactions that we've learned this week. That's all the alkene additions. That's Grignard's. That's alkyne reactions. And then these epoxide openings, and we didn't quite make it to oxidation, although the oxidations are are in in the textbook as well. Yeah. No. The side reactions you have to know are if I gave you a Grignard plus a carboxylic acid or if I gave you a Grignard plus water, you would know that that would be an acid base reaction like this one. Okay. Like that one. So you're going to have to write the products of the reactions. And if I give you the reactant and the product, you're going to have to maybe give me the reagent. For alkenes, alkynes, grignards, potentially epoxides. Um, mechanisms. The mechanisms would I would I would well I could ask you a mechanism of Grignard. Like I said, that's a piece of cake. I expect 100% on that from everybody. For the alkene reactions, it was the ones that we wrote the stars next to in the chart that we made on Tuesday. Now there's old, there's still old exams on in Canvas. Old exams number recently number one. Um, older ones probably number two maybe. So you might have to go through some of the exams and just see where there's reactions of alkenes and alkynes as well as these Grignard reactions. There are problem sets with narrated answer keys in t today's folder for the Grignards and for the oxidations and reductions and I think epoxide opening. So they're all, there's like four problem sets from today. So you have lots of problems to, for that. But the older exams are online. If you have any questions, I will be here, I think tomorrow I can guarantee I'll be here probably till three. And you can email me at any point in time I may be a little slow. I may be a few hours delay and over the weekend, but I will get to your emails if you send them to me.